Hello again, and welcome to the fourth webinar in a series of webinars that are addressing issues related to seismic retrofit of unreinforced masonry buildings. My name is Nicholas Van. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And we've partnered with the Association for Preservation Technology Northwest Chapter to bring you the series about unreinforced masonry buildings. And today, we're pleased to also partner with the International Masonry Institute and the Masonry Institute of Washington to bring you this great session. In a moment, I'll introduce you to Tanya Sorel Neal, Executive Director of the Masonry Institute of Washington. We will cover and have been covering an array of topics related to URMs through the webinar series. And to view other webinars in the series, including a recording of our first few webinars, or to register for future webinars, please go to our website at www.dahp.wa.gov slash URM Symposium. And don't worry, we'll put a link in the chat box so you don't have to remember that. We're also happy to provide AIA credits for those of you that have requested them. At the conclusion of the webinar, we'll send your AIA numbers to the AIA in order for you to receive credit. And we have to uh, let you know that the AIA learning objectives are as follows. Participants will be able to comprehend historic unreinforced masonry construction, understand properties and performance of historic masonry materials, identify and recognize design and construction problems that may occur in historic masonry construction, and select appropriate repair methods and procedures to solve original design detail and construction problems. And I'll let you know that the main focus of the talk um, by our presenters today uh, will be about the U.S. Marine Hospital in Seattle on Beacon Hill, which was also uh, Amazon's former headquarters. Today, we're honored to be able to collaborate with Tanya and the Masonry Institute of Washington. Tanya Sorel Neal serves as the Executive Director of the Masonry Institute of Washington, a statewide education and promotion entity serving Mason contractors, manufacturers, and suppliers working with brick, block, stone, marble, restoration, precast concrete, and tile. Tanya has more than 20 years of experience in the construction industry as an associate association director and legislative liaison. Tanya began her career in the construction industry in 1993 at the law firm of Brown, Todd, and Havern, focusing on construction defect litigation. In 1996, she transitioned to association representation as government affairs director, legislative liaison, and member services for the general contractor, subcontractor, and home building industries. Tanya has participated and actively engaged in the development of Seattle's URM Committee since 2010, as well as the newly created Portland URM Committee, which I believe has been since disbanded, um, unfortunately. If you tuned into our first webinar, you uh, can learn more about uh, both of those. Uh, she is the masonry industry representative for the Western State Clay Products Association, the Masonry Executive Council, and the Western Washington Masonry Trades Joint Apprenticeship Training Council. And without further ado, I will hand the reins over to Tanya, and she will introduce our program and our speakers today. Thank you so much, Nick. Sorry about the little bit of, um, oops, uh, the little bit of audio or uh, ATAV issues. Um, let's get started. Um, so we are going to talk about the Pacific Tower, which um, I know it as the former Amazon headquarters um, for most of the time that I've been here in the state of Washington. Um, and now I think we uh, are back with the city of Seattle and Seattle College. Um, as Nick gave me such a kind introduction, uh, I just want to give you my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to me at any time for any of your masonry needs. We define masonry as brick, block, stone, tile, terrazzo, and marble. Um, you can reach me via email or via cell phone at this point. Um, you know, just a couple quick little slides to tell you about the Masonry Institute of Washington and the International Masonry Institute. Um, you know, we're here to help you all deliver um, efficient, economical, and beautiful masonry systems. Um, we do that by supporting our signatory contractors, the AEC community, and our apprenticeship and training program for the masonry industry. The um, International Masonry Institute is funded by the IUBAC and the BAC contractors who employ BAC union members. They're proud to say that our contractors are known for staying on the cutting edge of industry standards, new materials, and techniques 
and a large part of that is thanks to our renowned training and education programs. Um, both the Masonry Institute of Washington and the IMI have, have building and closure experts available in all of the areas that we do um, train for. Um, and so we always encourage you, if you have a question about any of these products, please give us a call and we're here to help. Um, if you're looking for something specific, we have a number of certifications. We always like to let the spec writers know about these programs. Um, this is our way of guaranteeing quality installation on projects. And the best thing we can do is help make sure everybody is familiar in their training to IMI certificates and upgrades and then specifying those as well. Um, the, one of the other things that we do through both the Masonry Institute and the IMI is um, we do a lot of technology and research development. So everything from codes to new emerging products. And um, we try to stay on the cutting edge um, between the two organizations for uh, masonry products. Uh, as many of you guys know, we provide technical services, everything from plan reviews and detail reviews and job site troubleshooting to education programs. Um, on any one of about 33 topics right now. Um, we are doing most all of those by uh, virtual, virtual connection um, in order to keep everybody healthy, safe and healthy. But if you do have an issue that's coming up, we will make sure we're able to help figure that out. Um, many of you guys uh, have been to our golf tournament and um, we hope to have that return next year. Our networking opportunities are one of the ways that we connect the industry with the AEC community in order to make it easy for you to reach out when you do have questions. All right, the last is our technical services. Uh, we, we do technical promotion in a couple of different ways. In addition to our education classes, we have our National Masonry Systems Guide. This was published in 2018. It focuses on the top eight chapters or type top eight masonry systems. Um, it looks at things from a holistic approach and from a um, training perspective, the contractors are trained to the system in order to be able to look at everything from the sheathing out. And so if you um, haven't seen our masonry systems guide, um, although it doesn't touch on URM or restoration at this point, it is about new construction. Uh, I do hope that in the future, in the next couple of years, you'll see an, another couple chapters on uh, historic preservation. With that, um, I want to introduce our project. Um, the, for those of you who haven't um, been around for the history of the Pacific Tower. It was formerly known as the Pacific Medical Center. It's a 16-story building at 1212th Avenue South um, on Beacon Hill in Seattle. It was completed in 1932 and opened the following year as a U.S. Public Health Service facility. The lower floors of the facility still function as a medical center um, somewhat today. Um, Amazon.com occupied much of the building as its headquarters from 1999 until 2010. Much of the space was left vacant after Amazon relocated to South Lake Union. However, in 2013, the state of Washington agreed to a 30-year lease of 13 floors. Seattle Central College subleases six floors for its healthcare training program. Uh, the building was designed by Carl Friedling and Gold of Bev and Gold with assistance from John Graham and Company and built in a distinctive Art Deco style. The structure is perched on a hill overlooking downtown Seattle and is, prominent, is a prominent part of the city skyline. It has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places and has rec been recognized as a landmark by the city of Seattle. The building was retrofitted to better withstand earthquakes in the 90s. However, portions of the building suffered damage during the 2001 Nisqually earthquake. And today I'm happy and excited to have three gentlemen with me who participated in that re reconstruction. And I don't know if that's the right word, Steve. You can probably correct me on that. Um, first, I have Wayne Belcher with United Professionals Caulking and Restoration. Wayne was a master craftsman, project manager, and educator. He has been working with the sealant and waterproofing industry for over 25 years in the Pacific Northwest. He contributed in, found, in, in founding United Professionals in 1991 with over $60 million in successfully completed commercial contract work without construction defect claims or issues and has maintained a dedicated union workforce to ensure quality performance and dependability. Wayne, having specialized in building facade sealant detailing, currently works with general contractors, architects, consultants, and local unions in the training and education of good sealant practices and curriculum 
for development for apprenticeship training. My, our next panelist is Steve Dill. He was, he's more recently retired, a principal with KPFF Consulting Engineers. He has been actively involved in masonry designing and in construct masonry code development for more than 30 years. He is currently a member of the Seismic Subcommittee of the Masonry Standards Joint Committee, MSJC, and teaches the Masonry Refresher for the Structural Engineers Association of Washington. Our last panelist is Moni Fairweather with Fairweather Masonry. Moni is president of Fairweather Masonry Inc. and has extensive knowledge about masonry techniques, brick, terracotta, and tile masonry systems. He has served on numerous, numerous professional community committees, including president of the Washington State Mason Contractors Association. Moni began his career as a HUD carrier and quickly transitioned to the masonry industry as one of the officers of Fairweather Masonry Inc., a third three-generation family-owned business with early experience building Safeco Stadium and as lead project owner of Seahawk Stadium. His extensive experience with takeoff, spitting, negotiating, engineering, drawings, and management of masonry projects continues to keep him as an industry leader in the Northwest. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Dill to begin our presentation. I'm real excited to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you uh, for that nice introduction. Uh, pretty privileged to be up here with this, you know, collection of rap scallions here. Um, thank you all for joining into us today to listen to us talk about a project that I, for one, really enjoyed. I thought it was a great project and was a really important part of my career. It was a lot of fun. It was a really good team. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, this project that we're talking about is in uh, the Pacific Northwest. It's actually in Seattle. Next slide. Are you there, Tanya? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's actually in a very prominent location in Seattle. It's right at the intersection of Interstate 5 and I-90. So as you're driving either north or south on, on I-5 and you uh, look up the hill to the east, our project is kind of perched up there on the top. But at night, it's a really kind of interesting you know, piece of the Seattle landscape. So this is a building that I was aware of for years. It was, we had an opportunity to work on it. Um, as uh, Tanya said, this, was, uh, this building was originally an Art Deco building built in 1931 uh, as a Pacific Medical Center. It was part of the US public health system. Um, it really served most of its life as a medical building. In 1979, the building was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 92, it received a landmark status from the city of Seattle. And I think Tony told you all about that. Probably means more to you than it actually does to me. Um, the building was renovated in 1994. And Tanya, can you forward to the picture of the building? Next slide. Okay, so this was the building in its original form. Um, as it was built in 1931, with the slight exception of a little three-story addition that was off to the right side there. In 1994, the building was significantly modified, and next slide, Tonya, to what it looks like today. So there was a new addition added to the north side of that building, um, and as part of that addition, there was really a seismic upgrade in that structure all the way up to the 11th floor. So, um, you, you know, that turned out to be pretty significant as, as uh, time went on. Um, in 1999, Amazon moved into that building and in, as their headquarters. And in, on February 28th of 2001, the region uh, was hit by the Nisqually earthquake. It was a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. It was centered a little bit north of Olympia, northeast of Olympia. It affected the entire region in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Canada, all felt tremors from it. And it did a, a reasonable amount of damage in the Seattle area. The estimates are anywhere from $1 to $4 billion worth of damage. Whatever the actual estimate was, this building was clearly part of the damage that occurred. So it's interesting to note that if you look at this photo that we've got here, Again, you can see the 11-story addition on, on the side facing the camera. The area above that, floors 12 through 15, were really 
completely unmodified at the time of the restoration. And, and so it was that area of the structure that was really significantly damaged in the earthquake. This is the next slide, Tanya. All right, so let's look at the Nisqually earthquake and some of the things it did to this building. These photos are from a, a damage that was kind of a preliminary uh, report that went into the design as we first saw it. Um, you can see on the right, a lot of corner damage. Um, next slide, Tanya. That corner damage was pretty typical. You know, the good news is the damage was primarily in the corners of the building. The, the bad news was the building is all corners. So, um, you know, there's just tons of returns in that structure. Just keep kind of working your way through this. You can see, you know, not only broken, but badly displaced. Brick and terracotta elements are both involved. Some glass. Missing brick, missing terracotta. And in addition to the to kind of the corner issues, there was also some issues related to the column capitals. Okay, next slide, Tanya. Okay, one more. Right here, let's pause for a second at this slide. So column capitals in general were beat up a little bit, but this one in particular had a tower structure that was attached to it. You can see that on that photo on the right. Um, so there was, a, there was a tower that, that uh, had a, was founded really on a steel structure that was connected to this column capital. And that tower uh, got going a bit in the earthquake and, and, and levered a piece of that column capital off as I recall, that piece dropped three stories, hit the deck below, and then really never slowed down until it got one deck below that. So it went right through the first deck that hit it and, and moved down to the deck below. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. It was over a mechanical area. And parapets, you can see a bit on the left there. Um, so corners, column capitals, and parapets were the, the major pieces of the damage. And given all of that, the design team, obviously in conjunction with the owner, concluded that really the best thing that they could do was to take that cladding down from floor 12 and up and, and rebuild it. And so they set about doing that project, restoring the upper four floors, adding some more seismic system to it, and in the process, completely rebuilding the cladding systems. Next slide. Okay, the team that worked on this was Wright Runstead, was I, I believe the owner's rep. They were in the building on what I think was a long-term lease. The building was still, I think, owned at, by the city at that time. Um, the architect was ZGF. Uh, the engineer of record was ABKJ. General contractor was Selen. Fairweather Masonry uh, was the Mason contractor. Uh, the cladding engineer was KPFF. That's who I was working for. Uh, Mutual Materials really stepped in to, to take care of the brick piece of this. So the collection of materials where there was a bunch of brick that was taken down from the structure. There was a bunch of it that was damaged beyond reuse. And that part of the material was, um, was uh, replaced with a blend of seven different bricks from three different manufacturers and most mutual materials really took the lead in collecting all of those materials re-blending them back into the reused materials and putting them back on the building sealants were unipro that's wayne's company um, the pre the terracotta um, the damp a bunch of it was restored all of it was labeled and taken down off the building um, labeled and located that were too badly damaged to use were replaced with uh, uh, stained precast concrete that was very effectively done, in my opinion, by Kruger Concrete out of, out of Edmonton. So that was the team that worked on it. Um, at the time the Mason contractor uh, jumped into this, there was already a, some preliminary design documents out. 
the design team saw this as uh, really an anchored veneer. So a, a cavity wall uh, with a drainage mat uh, designed to work like a typical anchored veneer system. Uh, next slide, Tanya. The, uh, the details of that were kind of like you'd expect. So here's a cut through a terracotta element. You can see that there is a ledger angle intended to support the brick above, a cavity behind that brick, and flashings, et cetera, to get the water out. The terracotta pieces of this were also supported on another um, ledger angle with another cavity behind them, and then the brick below. Uh, some of the elements were straight, like the ones that you saw. Some of them were sloped. Uh, in the cases where they sloped, those angles that we're talking about were sloped through there. And uh, there was a lot of really deep relief in this uh, stuff. You know, slow down just a bit here, Tony. Can you back up one slide? So um, these deep relief elements, uh, this was pretty typical. You know, you've got a, a, a skin that comes up and then, you know, like a foot and a half offset kind of back to another piece of, of masonry going up. And that's all terracotta. The idea for those would, it would be a drainage cavity behind that terracotta in the front. And then where that horizontal piece needed some additional support, you put some steel strut, stud structure in there to hold up one end of that, let the other end sit on the veneer that was tied back. And then again, another angle with brick on top. So kind of a complicated, a bit convoluted approach, I think, to how to deal with all of that plan relief. But the uh, caps, the parapet caps were, um, done in a semi-solid way. So the parts that were supported from the perimeter beam were routed solid and really suspended from the concrete. The idea for the parts above were, were that there would be a drainage cavity behind that terracotta and it would be mounted to a, a concrete wall. Next slide. So um, when Fairweather was brought into this, Fairweather brought KPFF into it. We sat down, we talked about it. It was Selen's interest in understanding, getting some ideas of what the system might cost and to get ideas for how it could be improved. Um, the trouble that we saw with the design as, as we saw it um, preliminarily designed was that it sounded good when you looked at these individual elements, you could see ways to build it all. But when you looked at the height of the building, what you saw was a very complicated, very convoluted, arrangement of of materials so yes there's some window openings yes there's some terracotta pieces yes there's some return corners but they're arranged in a very complex way and we we were very concerned that the, the idea of a cavity wall um, with ledger angles um, around it would 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 get overly complicated overly expensive and then we were concerned about how fragile the system also fell. Okay, hey, Steve. Deep... Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, if everybody would notice that relief on the left-hand portion of the picture right there, kind of explains what Steve's talking about on how far we would have to take out angles to carry the loads for all of these brick um, compared to what it was built up originally. Just wanted everybody to notice that right quick. Yeah, those reliefs yeah, are over half the time. Uh, so, so lots of challenges in trying to do this as an anchored veneer with a cavity behind it. And uh, so we came back with our collection of concerns uh, and then someone asked us to go off and, 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 and get straight on a, a recommended approach. And so we came back with uh, a modified design. Uh, Tanya, can you go ahead and, and advance a slide or two? All right, stop right there. Um, so as, as we sat down as a team and thought about this thing, um, we decided there were some things that were pretty important in how it needed to work. And first and foremost, we really thought that we needed to, to, to better control the weight of this facade. Um, you know, these elements were heavy. They were very eccentric. 
uh, in and out of plane all over the place. And we were just concerned that they need to be very positively, very consistently connected back to the structure. Um, we wanted to provide isolation from vertical movements at each floor. So we wanted it, we, we knew there was going to be some new concrete elements in this, some new shear walls and stuff. And um, possibility for some shrinkage. We didn't want this veneer to end up, you know, carrying the weight of the building. And so we worked hard to work um, a relief angle in at every floor to, to make sure that we could relieve some of the, the, the structural loads from the veneer. Um, we wanted to improve in-plane isolation if we could. Um, very difficult. The, the skin was so articulated, it was very, very difficult to isolate. Um, new shear walls going in, so we never thought that the, the system would ever see the kind of deformations that it saw in the original earthquake, but we wanted to improve its seismic performance if we could. And then lastly, we wanted to make this thing tough. Um, you know, it, 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 it felt fragile to us. It felt like if, if we saw some movements or some things that we weren't expecting that we could get some pretty bad cracks. And then lastly, we wanted to do this thing right. We knew it was going to be expensive. Um, we knew it was going to take a lot of time. The last thing we wanted to do is, is to come back and deal with a bunch of problems. So um, we left, we came back with a, a collection of details that looked kind of like this one. And really kind of working from the studs out, what we decided to do was to, to utilize the studs that the original drawing had indicated to put a backer board over those studs, to penetrate through the backer board into the flange of the studs with a stainless steel eye bolt. And so we used quarter inch eye bolts that we um, nutted off to the stud we dropped a 3 8 inch stainless steel threaded rod through that eye bolt, which was a, a good tight snug fit. And then we wired horizontal threaded rods, stainless steel threaded rods to that, to those verticals. And then the idea was we, we were gonna take dead soft stainless steel wire and connect it to the veneer whatever that may happen to be. We used, we used uh, wall ties, a collection of different wall ties in the brick, in the terracotta elements. We, we ended up kind of drilling those and putting pins in them and then, and then wiring them back and stabilizing them back to that same sta stainless steel mesh. Um, when that was all in place, we grouted it solid. And so we put a very fine, uh, low slump grout into that cavity and, and made the whole thing monolithic. So anyway, that was the big idea. Um, we took it back to the group. We kind of led a discussion that went on for a couple of days regarding contrasting the uh, benefits of that system vis-a-vis -vis the ungrouted system. And we sort of settled on, on, on this matrix. Um, the thought was is that as it related to, to which system would be more, more likely to crack or have severe cracking problems. The advantage was, was seen to be with the grouted system. It was considered to be a lot tougher. It was reinforced. Um, always possible for those systems to crack, but, but highly unlikely that a crack would ever get big. As it related to dampness, we knew that one of the disadvantages of grouting that cavity is that um, that grout was going to get wet, and it was going to get wet and stay wet. There was a chance that that thing would be damp all year through. And so whatever we did, we knew we needed to deal with that dampness. Outright leakage, it was assumed the grouted system would actually work better, and there was some debate on this issue. You know, a lot of people were concerned about how the water was going to get out. The counterargument was, if you grout the system, how's it going to get in? And um, so we went back and forth on that, but I think that, you know, history has kind of proven that that system worked really, really well from in, in the mode of preventing leakage. Seismic performance was given to be a bit of a toss up, a, a little bit easier to isolate the anchored veneer, but, but the reinforced grouted system was so much tougher and so much more ductile. Constructability was really the reason we were in there. Um, Fairweather was very concerned about the complexity of building that cavity wall system 
and was much more comfortable building this in a grouted way. Durability, again, pointing to the reinforcement was considered better for the grouted system. And it, some people were concerned about efflorescence and it was considered to be a bit of a toss up. Um, so anyway, they went back to the design team, ownership group, they, everybody got on board with switching the system from a uh, cavity wall to a, a grouted cavity. And we went back and, and started designing. Typical wall was just as I described before. In some cases, the backup was steel. In other cases, it was concrete. But basically, it was the same arrangement of materials. Next slide. Uh, terracotta, we did the same way. Uh, ties were, were typically in vertical joints instead of horizontal joints, but uh, were wired back and supported in exactly the same way as, as the brick. Next slide. Corners. Next. In the deep reveals. Uh, these worked really well, actually. Uh, so th the way this worked, what we did is we put ties in the in the thicker system. We tied them back to the to the a mesh of steel, and in the thinner areas, we just let them be there. We supported on both sides, and then again, we had to be careful when we grouted this stuff up to make sure we didn't get blowouts. But there was no angles required to support any of that stuff. Next slide. Yeah, this was pretty interesting. So this is some of the areas where we needed to dead load right back to, to beam elements and stuff. And remember in the old, uh, the original design, in all of these areas, there were sloped angles that were placed under the terracotta and under the brick um, to support all of those pieces that you went up the height. All we really needed to do on this one is find a little piece of angle somewhere that we could hide it connect our mesh of reinforcement in there. And then when we, when we grouted it all up solid, we really had a reinforced piece of concrete that was attached back to the structure. So it worked great. Right. Next slide. Hey, Steve. Yeah. So if everybody can imagine by just looking at this picture right here, how many angles would have to have been made uh, for relief of all these pieces out in the field? Uh, it probably would have tripled the cost plus all the flashings on top of that. Yeah, I think when we talked about that money, we decided that we probably need to have a full-time uh, metal worker there just to fabricate angles for us on the fly because there was no way to anticipate all these and have them stop. Absolutely. So anyway, um, in, in some cases, I mean, this little detail is kind of interesting. This was a new piece of concrete. We needed to figure out a way to get grout into that piece of terracotta below. And, and on some cases, we actually had little ports kind of cast into the concrete so that we could pour our grout through those and catch the, gap, the cavities below. The returns were handled um, like this. I mean, in some cases, we could have, in theory, filled that whole cavity up with grout. It would have been a lot of concrete, a lot of weight. So in some cases, we built out some steel stud structure to, to, to move the grout cavity out away from the concrete. And then, uh, you know, created little reinforced elements as we needed to, to, to get the weight back to where we wanted it. So you can see we built a little, a little beam on that one. Um, the the uh, parapets were, were, were done this way, um, both, I believe, with the terracotta and with the uh, any new precast that had to be, uh, you know, built for it. Um, we just put grout tubes through it, uh, anchored it down to the to the wall below, and poured them, and it works great. We use that detail a lot. Next slide. Okay, remember we had a big debate about water, and uh, there was a lot of people that were concerned about this system leaking. And, uh, you know, there was a kind of a, an academic argument that, yeah, how's it going to leak when it's when the water can't flow in it, when it's completely full of grout? Pretty good argument. But but people were concerned enough about water that we decided the best thing to do was to treat it as if all of that leaked anyway and as if there were water flowing in that cavity. And so we did that. We had a, uh, a, a flashing buildup that completely flashed out that cavity system. It started with a little piece of stainless steel flashing that was put at the angle levels 
Next slide. There was some bitchethane pieces. Next slide, Tonya. There were some bitchethane uh, pieces of flashing that were put above that and uh, kind of went up to the to the corner, and then there was another piece of flashing that went over that. If you can back up just a little bit, you've gone about five slides ahead now. Yeah, right there. So bitchethane flashing, next slide. And then there was a, a product called Center Flash that was counter flashed over the, the bitchethane. I believe it was there because it was compatible with the uh, waterproof membrane. Is, it, is that right, Monty? It was. Yeah. So then, uh, then there was a membrane that went over the top of that and, and flashed the whole back side of that cavity. Um, we added weeps, uh, drainage mats and weeps, uh, again, with the idea that if it was ever running water, we needed to give it away out. As it turns out, I don't think I ever saw a drop of water coming out any of those weeps. Okay, next slide. Um, Steve, the next slide is, we're going to start the construction. Um, yeah. However, we have a question. Yeah, what, let's was, talk. what was the original mortar mix and what was the repair mix? What was the partial fill material for the terracotta anchorage? Do you remember that, Monty? I'm not sure what the original, I don't, when I say I'm not sure, I said I don't recall what the original was. Um, and I think we use type N to put it back. And is that typical for a um, restoration projects like this to use type N? Yeah, because you, you don't want it as strong as the mortars that we make now. Okay. The fill for the terracotta was pretty much junk. Uh, look like whatever they could throw into the middle of those pieces, like Steve was talking about that first piece that went down, uh, and it just came down in big chunks, and it was very heavy. I hope that answers the question. You know, I would like to throw out to remember this, we did this job 20 years ago, and so there, there's a really good chance that, you know, uh, standards, particularly for historic buildings, have evolved since the time that we did this. And so for me, as I recall, I don't remember anybody pushing, you know, an historic blend of, of mortar. I think we were just, we, we were there selecting the mortar that we thought would do the best for the building. There, there, was, there was no historic push on that, to my recollection. And Monty, can you talk about the how the vertical threaded rod was installed through the hooks? Uh, all that was put on before we started laying brick. Um, uh, uh, specially cut, everything was pr pretty much fad while we were there. Um, and then once all that, it's kind of a mesh system that kind of went up. And you'll be able to see some pictures shortly uh, that'll probably give you a better idea of how we did that. Um, and then, then we can only lay so many brick because we were pouring that cavity because if we laid too high, it was too much pressure with the concrete to push out the brick. You'll be able to see some pictures here shortly that'll probably give you a better description. All right, let's go on. <laughs> Actually, Tanya, this All is right. Nick. I, can, I, I think I can address Steve's um, comment about uh, you know whether or not the guidance for using uh, historic mortar mixes has changed over the last 20 years. And I'll say that, you know, the guidance hasn't really changed much. And what you're doing as, uh, you know, engineers and masonry contractors uh, is, you know, it's, it's very logical. You want to use a mortar that's sacrificial um, so that water is not going through the masonry unit itself, because obviously that's your structure. Um, so as long as the, the mortar mix is a lower compressive strength as the masonry units, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that you would prescriptively saying that you're using a type N every time. You really have to look at the, the units themselves, but you know, terracotta tends to be um, you know, different than a soft, maybe locally sourced um, uh, you know, typical masonry unit um, because they're manufactured and the manufacturing process is totally different. So 
I'll throw a link to preservation brief too uh, into the chat box for the audience members. And, uh, you can see um, for yourself, uh, you know, what the guidance is and and has been for um, for as long as most of us can probably remember. Thanks, Nick. That's wonderful. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve, ready to continue with construction? Sure. Yeah. So uh, you know, this is just a few things that we ran into in construction. I think one of the one of the interesting parts of this uh, of this restoration was that this building was occupied. So um, you know the, the the first ten stories of this building were 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 occupied at the time we were doing the restoration, and we needed to get really really full access to the upper four four stories of this building. We needed to wrap it. We needed to be able to continuously get to all of it, and uh, we really didn't want to build scaffolding from the ground in order to do it. So the the way that we we solved that problem. So next slide, Tanya. is that we uh, we stuck uh, some wide flanges out the windows. So um, there was perimeter windows in this in this building. We, we went through those openings uh, with some wide flange steel that we supported on steel structures on the interior of the building and then back spanned to the, uh, to the elevator core and tied off. So those steel beams sticking out, there's a picture of the support structure that was at the windows. And then the picture on the right is a picture of one of those beams that would be sticking out the window, backspanned to the elevator core. And that steel um, in combination with some, some uh, uh, purlins that we put over the top of it and plywood really served as the base for our uh, scaffolding. And so we scaffolded uh, continuously from there up um, and wrapped it. So uh, they were working through the winter on this thing. You can see that the uh, lateral supports for the uh, uh, scaffolding are kind of penetrating through the brick. And, um, and so, you know, they needed to kind of leave those places open as the repair went up. And then next slide, Tanya, as, as they came down, they would you know, pull the lateral braces out of that area and then infill those pieces um, around the, the bracing to complete the restoration. We had some, some uh, W18s that we were looking for a project for for a number of years after that one. Um, we had a, uh, a mock-up panel on this and uh, a pretty rigorous one, as I recall. We re really were able to test all of the detailing. Um, very helpful. I mean, I think it always is. They're expensive, but they're helpful. And uh, we were able to both see the quality, set the quality standards, as well as really understand our procedures better by building that mock-up. Steve, Another, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm I would also offer to everyone, especially with these historic restoration projects, that you want to make sure you do your mock-up. And when you do your mock-up, include all the elements of it. If there's anything that we can impress upon everyone is those mock-ups are going to be the thing that you that keeps you out of litigation in the future. And so you want to be able to make sure all the elements that you're putting on the system are in the mock-up. And then you also want to save your those mock-ups and not um, do away with them after they've been approved. So put them somewhere or keep them on the site um, where they can um, be available if need be as you move forward. I think this mock-up was this mock-up was super important for constructability, but it was also super important uh, for the brick blend and to make sure that we got the color right. Um, as Steve was saying earlier, this is a, a uh, three manufactured brick product project with Muddix brick, interstate brick, and mutual materials with reclaimed brick from the original building. And so that blend, uh, we had to get just right. Um, and then in the field, if everybody noticed that uh, all the scaffold is wrapped, it's very hard to see that blend going up and be true about it. Um, until all that's gone. 
the scaffold gone and, and everything. But uh, I think we did a lot of good prep work and I think we did a really good job getting that done. Yeah, as I recall, I think that Mutual took all of that brick back to their place and re-blended it all and, and repalletized it. Actually, actually, we hired their blender who stayed on site the full time and blended as we went. Oh, really? Wow. Yep. Yeah. Wow. I'd forgotten that. Thank you for that. You know, it's funny when these projects get this old, you forget some of the details. Next slide. There's one of the weeps that never, as far as I know, never uh, had any water in them. Here's that map that we're talking about. So there's some questions about how we did this. Well, really, those eye bolts uh, th that are are connected into the flange of the studs, bituthane patch, you know, at the at the level of the backer board to make sure they're sealed, and and that's just a you know, a fairly snug fit up in the eye bolt. So the bar, the vertical bar just drops in there. And um, you know, you need enough room to get over the top of it and run it down the eyes, but you're gonna run it right through the eyes. And then when you get it to the level you want, you wire it off. And then the horizontals just are laid on top of the eyes and get wired. So that, that grid went together pretty easily. Okay, here's um, some of the rebuilt masonry. Uh, you can see some of the blue tags sitting on the terracotta. Those were the, the, the labels that were all placed on when the, when the system was first disassembled. And they're all put back into their original locations. Those are great pictures, Steve. Uh, keep in mind that everything came off of that building four stories. So everything was pictured, cataloged, dimensions taken, uh, great detail, so that we were absolutely positive we could put that back the same way. Okay, next slide. Okay, system cost. Monty, you got anything you wanna say about this? Uh, really, I think if we would have done it the original method, uh, which is a cavity wall, angle irons, flashings. Um, I honestly, it, I think it would have taken triple what, what it took us. Not saying that what we did that we did up there was expensive because it was expensive, but it would have been way more and it probably would have taken three times as much time as well. So Steve, what, what is your thought about the, um, the drainage system versus the way you've done it with a with this historic building. Well, it's interesting. You know, I think that um, you know I, I'm old enough now that I guess have a little bit of perspective. Uh, but I think sometimes we get enamored with modern systems and we think it's you know that they're just better because they're newer. And and cavity walls are, are kind of the, the the current approach to to brick systems. Um, but I, I don't think they're the best choice for, for all situations. And, and, uh, and I think particularly this building, with the amount of plan relief that was in it and stuff, there was a reason that they built those solid back in the day. And that's because they could handle the weight a lot easier. And, and I think the presence of that cavity makes it a lot tougher um, to build it. The other thing that, to keep in mind about cavities is that while they are good at getting rid of water, they are also good at moving it around to a place where there might be a problem. So if you end up with a, a bad flashing detail or something, and then you've got a cavity back there to channel a whole bunch of water to that bad flashing detail, you can end up with a big problem. And as complicated as that all felt on this building, we just didn't think we could make that work. Great. All right, Wayne, can you talk to us a little bit about some specifics regarding forecasting and budgeting for restoration projects? Well, I, in many of the restoration projects that I've been involved with, the forecasting of, of budgets needs to be very, very accurate. Not only does it save time on the project, but it improves the estimates, it reduces errors. Uh, it really promotes collaboration with the design team and all that are participating in the building of the project. It also allows you to identify any unanticipated expenses. Uh, so being able to analyze that unexpected scope, perhaps uh, make those changes as they occur. Accurate forecasting is extremely important. 
It also allows for maybe any contingency plans that might be necessary. It answers questions, just how is the money going to be spent uh, and where is it going to? And it provides for a future trajectory of the project as well. So all of that's very important for accurate forecasting. Then the second bullet point there, pre-planning consultants. Um, that's very important, uh, working with a consultant. Uh, KP, KPFF, for example, here on the Amazon project, working with Fairweather Masonry. Uh, we were the sealant contractor. We didn't have all, any part of anything to do with the masonry, but still we were involved in the process and we really benefited uh, from the consultant. Uh, in this particular case, the consultant was able to handle structural issues and give planning, problem solving, uh, giving the right analysis to how it was going to be erected and constructed. So all of that was very important. Then the third bullet point, managing the budget with discoveries. Nobody likes unexpected discoveries. Uh, it can be costly, but um, accurately identifying what those surprises might be, how to handle them, document them as, as was thoroughly done with, by Fairweather Masonry here on the Amazon project. And then not only that, but confirming of those documents so that costs can be presented to the owner as well. So those three bullet points are very important when it comes to restoration projects, uh, not only on this job that we're featuring today, but on so many of the other ones over the last 30 years that I've been involved with. Monty, do you recall what the biggest budget challenge was or the biggest or the most unexpected um, unbudgeted item was for this particular project? Oh, definitely access. Because everything, you, always, you had to do it twice here. Everything had to come down. You had to take it somewhere, make sure it's cataloged, cleaned, mended, uh, and then go back up. And when you're 16 floors up, uh, access was the biggest, one of the biggest issues here. All right, are we ready to move on to lessons learned, Steve? I think so. Is there any questions, I guess, on any of that? Is anything coming no. into you, Tanya? No questions on the, those topics. Okay. Um, well, these, these were just a few of the little things that we, we saw as we went through this thing. First of all, you know, grouting that cavity, um, we were very pleased with. I think in the long run, um, that approach uh, just, just seemed to work. And, and once people figured out how to do it, um, it, it went really well. We, we, we originally um, were trying to, to connect our grid to concrete using these pneumatic fasteners and they didn't work very well. So we ended up using um, drills and, and, and driving pins and that seemed to work a lot better. And then I think one of the things that we all learned is that when you're, when you're pouring a very fluid grout, into these systems, you gotta be really careful with a number of things. You gotta be really careful to make sure you've got the grout space blocked appropriately, that there's no way for the grout to leak out because it'll make a big mess if it does. Um, the, the grout pressures are, are really significant, so you gotta make sure that you have the, the brick very well anchored back to that, in our case, that steel mesh. And then third, you gotta be careful with your pore heights. So um, if you pour that in slowly, you know, the, the fluidity of that will kind of bleed off as the water goes into the brick and you can, you can get it poured up. But if you try to pour too much too fast, um, it's just a big mess. And so um, I think when we finally got this figured out, um, as I recall, that they, they were trying to do like a foot or two around the building a day. And um, they would come in the next morning and and or actually they'd grout that piece before they left uh they'd let the moisture bleed off and then they'd come in the next day put up another foot or or two of, of masonry and then grout it before they went home so once they got into that rhythm things worked worked really well and uh wayne do you want to talk a little bit about some of the general is issues we've learned about well some of the general issues that, um, again, I was just a, as a subcontractor, I really appreciated being part of the design team and having that communication trickle down to me as a lower tier sub on this particular project. Other projects, 
uh, I may have a greater participation in. But on this one, just being involved with the general contractor, I had a, I had a contract with Sella uh, to do all the sealant works and then work in collaboration with Fairweather Masonry and KPFF. So just being part of the program, being able to be involved and, and receive that information real time was very, very helpful for us to do our work so that we didn't just work on hopes and guesswork. We had direct information uh, given to us. We were able to save time and do the work properly the first time. So it was a great benefit to us in that regard. Ani, do you have any lessons learned that you've taken away from this project? Uh, you know, I like Wayne's comments. The collaboration that we had with everybody out there, um, if, if we didn't have that, it wouldn't have got done that the way it did. Um, so I was really happy about that. Uh, quick note, uh, if you're looking at your screen, you can see that fellow holding the trowel there. Uh, he's na his name is Les Henson. And we brought him up there to help finish the project because uh, he was one of the bricklayers that originally constructed that building. Kind of cool. Yeah, he was one 94 at the time, wasn't he? Yes. One of the things we like to note is the fact that um, many of the bricklayers over the last 30 years have claimed to have done some type of work on this building at one point or another. And so um, just going back to the durability of our masonry products, um, you never know how long a building is going to stand overlooking the city. All right. Tanya, okay. may I make one more comment? Absolutely. On, on the third uh, item there, the historical landmark nature of some of the projects working with the Preservation Board. I've had that privilege uh, many times. Uh, sometimes the historical landmark uh, Preservation Board is seen as the enemy. There's a lot of regulations. There's a lot of constraints. There's a, a lot of things to uh, to be aware of. Uh, I, I happen to very much enjoy working with them because it helps you do your research, maintains the building's integrity. Uh, it helps with the submitting of plans and to um, uh, to design various adjustments in harmony with historical restoration. So that's a very, very important facet of a project like this and many other of the, other of the historical projects that we work on. Uh, and, and one thing that I've learned in working with, as a, as a lower tier sub with all of these wonderful professionals, be patient, be patient, because sometimes it takes a little time to do the, do the documentation the best you can and, and work with them as a team player. We at IMI have three historical restoration and preservationists on staff. And um, if anybody has any questions about a project that you're just unsure with, or you've got a, uh, another entity and agency that you need to work with like NICS or the historical landmarks, um, give us a call because uh, somebody at one point or another should be able to help you and has dealt with many of those problems. So we always encourage you to go ahead and give us a call, not to try to just uh, close your eyes and, and see if it fixes itself, because a lot of times there's a couple different options. Those. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Echo with that, Tanya. Uh, we're we're always happy to help and and provide guidance or connect you to resources that, um, you know, we might have seen um, in our experience uh, working on these types of projects. So it's great to expand the network and and continue to collaborate. You know, I might say that there is a reward for the effort, knowing that you're saving a piece of history, yet for a future generation. Uh, this project uh, here, the Amazon building, is just a wonderful feature to the landscape of downtown Seattle. Okay. All right, going on to future applications. Steve, back to you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Back at the time we did this, and, and these future applications were all ideas that we had 20 years ago. So um, it's curious to see whether we any of these actually happened. Next slide, Tanya. But in our opinion, uh, you know, the, for the repair of mass walls, this, this was a really solid approach, particularly intricate mass walls. And so we expected to see more of that uh, coming down the road. And actually, we thought as a technique for new construction, it was interesting, um, particularly with very heavy or eccentric um, integrated elements. And um, 
And then, you know, we also consider the, the chance that you actually could use this as a lateral system. The, 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 that masonry, um, as reinforced, uh, was very strong and ductile. So there was a lot of capacity that we put in that cladding system that could actually be a component of a lateral system. So anyway, those are some ideas we had back in the day. I don't know whether any of those have actually uh, panned out. All right. Thank you, Steve and Monty and uh, Wayne. We've got one question. What was the grout composition? Um, this was a, a, a very fluid, fine grout. As I recall, I don't think there was any pea gravel in this. I think it was a sand grout. And it was, um, it was expansive. So we put um, a super plasticizer in it with a little bit of expansion agent in it. And, uh, and it seemed to work really good. It was very, very fluid. So, you know, we had, again, had to make sure that we handled ourselves well around that grout. 